first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for accepting my paper and for putting together such a fascinating session. Um, today I will be discussing the use of brooches during the Viking Age as symbols and signifiers of power. I will start by briefly discussing modern examples of in the interpretation of messages presented by brooches. Um, following that, I will go into a brief discussion of semiotics and the ways in which style has been interpreted in archaeology, directly applying some interpretive frameworks to Scandinavian brooches, particularly in Scotland. Then I will broaden my approach using socio-semiotics, enabling a more comprehensive look at signals of identity and power being emitted by brooches. There are many recent examples of the powerful meanings that brooches can display, as illustrated by prominent figures such as Madeleine Albright, who even explained the intention behind her brooches in the book Read My Pens, as you can see here, and Queen Elizabeth II, whose brooches during state visits have been interpreted as political statements with a recent instance being dubbed brooch warfare um, <laughs> when she wore a pin gifted to her by the Obamas to meet with the Trumps. <laughs> the primary means of interpreting both modern and past brooches is through semiotics, the study of signs and their meanings. Since Charles Sanders Pierce began writing on semiotics in the 1860s, the relationship between sign, object, and interpretant has been studied in most areas of academia. More specific to us as archaeologists, Prussell states that archaeology should be considered a semiotic enterprise, as all archaeologists are inherently drawing meaning um, from the past, although few archaeologists have engaged with the literature on semiotics recently. Among those that have, many base their interpretations in literary theory, primarily using a Saussurean approach. This has a major flaw in that it centers on the sign's focus on rules and codes while ignoring social practice. <coughs> I will be using two examples from Scotland during the Viking Age as the cultural mixing of the region would have led to a more diverse signaling pool and then comparing it to one in particular in Scandinavia. The brooches themselves I would like to consider um, as a symbol of Scandinavian identity, whereas the actual decorations require cultural context, making them indexical. Having these distinctions in how they could be interpreted brings us to Wolf's model um, on emitter and receivers, which, although it has its flaws, does provide an explanatory framework as to the desired levels of interpretation within a given social context. The emitter in this case, I would say, were both the brooches and the person wearing them, as the brooch itself will continue to emit many of its messages of status and power without a wearer, as we can see from the fact that the quality of a brooch determines whether or not it will be displayed in a museum. If indeed it is displayed, messages are still being emitted to those who see it, even if they have little or no cultural context. The second level can be understood as the people living in the household where the owner of the brooches lives, or in an odd sense, the creator of the brooch, who would also have a familial level of understanding of the brooches. The third level would likely include close neighbors, friends, and relatives that are not part of the immediate household. And on the fourth level, I think we have one of the main target groups for interpretation of the brooches. At this level, the brooches are more fully emitting levels of power and status. <coughs> within Scotland, the targets were likely people within the broader region, perhaps sworn to ting sites in order to denote power and status of the man or woman wearing them, as well as their place within the Scandinavian community more generally, whether born into it or not. I think that at the fifth level, the emitters are still having the desired effect. So I crossed out the non-target group in Wilkes <laughs> model. Um, as I said before, the power and status of the brooches and the person wearing them does not need cultural context in order to be understood. Therefore, if the wearer were one of the first settlers of Orkney and were seen by the local population, it would be easily understandable that this was a person of power, status, and most likely wealth. 
Well, I think Lopes' model has many good points. I think there is more that can be discussed than emitter and receiver of messages being pre presented by stylistic elements. In order to inter interpret um, archaeological remains, I will be using a socio-semiotic approach, which is defined by Gottdemir and Agopoulos um, as the materialistic analysis of ideology in everyday life. Although I prefer <laughs> Cobley and Randevere's definition as being a matter of, critical, of a critical sign study that is aware of the specific and strategic ways in which signs <coughs> are deployed in social formations, which removes the ideological necessity from the first definition. Within the, um, an archaeological context, Garcia Canclini proposes that sociosemiotics embraces the processes of production, circulation, and consumption of meanings in social life. In using this approach, the equitable meaning should be given to the processes of production, circulation, and consumption. The production of a brooch will be laden with culturally dependent aspects. In the case of Scandinavian brooches from the Viking Age, the coating of the reverse of a brooch in tin, a practice which protected the brooch against wear as well as the wearer's clothing from staining, is a treatment which marks out Scandinavian artifacts from the mid 6th to 12th century in the British Isles. Additionally, Scandinavian style pins tended to be domed and with a double pin lug, sometimes with a suspension loop as well. Decorative motifs, while similar to other styles in the early medieval period, are still distinguishable as Scandinavian, although many hybridized styles also existed. The circulation of brooches from Scandinavia into the British Isles carries its own meaning. The ability to import personal ornaments would denote a certain level of prestige within a community. Additionally, the understanding of someone as a new arrival could be understood if the brooches were brought over by the wearer in their migration from Scandinavia. One of the more interesting meanings found in the circulation process is the use of Scandinavian brooches for several generations <laughs> by people who are likely not of Scandinavian descent. We might pose the question then, what does it mean for brooches to be used over several generations or for someone not of Scandinavian descent to take part in the use of Scandinavian personal ornamentation? In the first instance, the brooches are likely heirlooms. I think this can be seen as a call for viewing brooches not as cultural definers, but rather as identifiers, meaning that the person wearing the brooch likely identified themselves with Scandinavian or um, insular culture, but in excavations should not be interpreted as of those origins. There are several burials from Scotland that allow for the application of sociosemiotics to their interpretation. Um, the first example I will discuss is um, that of a female from West Ness in Orkney who appears to have died in childbirth. When compared with other burials in the cemetery, um, which was primarily composed of Scandinavian and local peoples, the isotopic signatures of the individual indicated that she was likely of insular origins, but not from Orkney, so meaning she's from the British Isles. Given this evidence, her burial goods provided an interesting understanding of how to interpret brooches during the Viking Age. The most famous of the artifacts um, is the West Ness brooch. So oh, let's see, it's that one right there. And it's been compared to the Hunterston brooch, which is a very um, elaborate design. This particular one is gilt silver um, and has fili gold filigree and was inlaid with amber. It is thought to have been made around 100 years before it was buried, coming from Ireland. In conjunction with this, a pair of oval brooches were worn by the woman, paired, um, accompanied by 40 glass beads, likely indicating a necklace was attached to the brooches. In addition, there was a fourth brooch found in the burial that was created from an insular book mount. Generally, the wearing of oval brooches is thought to indicate a Scandinavian cultural affinity. However, when the four brooches are read together, they could be interpreted as a signal of cultural identification with both Irish and Scandinavian. 
Halstead McGuire proposes that the brooches can be seen as a statement regarding the relationship between Scandinavian settlers and the various peoples of the British Isles. Given the varied origins and methods of production, the brooches are emitting power and prestige among various communities. The West Ness brooch was circulated for 100 years before it came to be buried, which denotes it as a powerful object deserving of curation. With the reuse of an insular book mount, the same could also be said. The final use of all of these brooches together is a sign of multiple cultural identities and a signaling of power within them all. The next grave is that of one found at Neep um, in the Isle of Lewis. This is another female dating to the late 10th, early 11th century. She was also buried with a range of grave goods, including a pair of oval brooches, 44 glass beads, a bronze Hiberno Norse um, ringed pin brooch, tools, and a decorated bronze belt buckle and strap end. The oval brooches are not the same in design. However, both are identical in construction. Each is of gilded cast bronze and has been formed from two main shells positioned one on top of the other. The main body of the upper shell consists of an open lattice work of stylized animal ornament. This is seated on the surface of a lower shell of a simple gilded dome. These have been dated to the late 9th, early 10th century. On the other hand, the ringed pin dates to the late 10th or early 11th century. Her isotopic signatures indicate that she was from the area in which she was buried, making the meaning behind her brooches even more ambiguous than those of Westness. Hare Smith um, suggested that she was of mixed Scandinavian and insular descent. Um, no matter what her actual descent may be, the brooches she was buried with show two cultural affiliations. The curation of oval brooches from around 100 years before she was buried likely shows them as an heirloom, much the same as I would argue for the West Ness brooch. The Hiberno Norse ringed pin, on the other hand, links her to Ireland. The combination of the three brooches can be seen as signifying her status within the community and her family, as hers is the richest burial in the cemetery at Neat. But it may also show her power and status within the overall insular and Scandinavian communities, with her brooches indicating her <coughs> position within those cultural groups. In Scandinavia, there are also examples of mixed brooches or uses of brooches, with 22 burials in Norway showing use of insular brooches in burial. One example is from Snossa and Trondelag. This is yet again the burial of a woman, both with a pair of oval brooches and an insular brooch, which is pictured here. Given the um, placement of the brooches at the time of excavation, it is thought that she had one oval brooch at each shoulder for holding up a strap dress and the insular ring brooch in the middle of her chest for fastening a cape or cloak. Given the similarities of the brooch to one of to the one from Snossa um, and Westness, it is likely that the woman from Westness would have been dressed in a similar way. James Graham Campbell has suggested that the incorporation of Pictish and Irish brooch types as cloak fasteners in Norse dress might be viewed as glittering prizes. The use of exotic to make this statements, um, to make statements concerning status while Hen Peterson sees the prestige of owning and being buried with such items as an indication that the wearers of the brooch, or at least their families, had a particularly important role within these overseas networks. I think they are better read in a similar way to those found in the frontiers of Viking Age society, as symbols of power and belonging in both insular and Scandinavian society, whether this is through descent or some other connection. These three burials, although separated in space and time, provide examples of brooches used during the Viking Age to signify power and status within their community. And as I po posited above, their affiliation with more than one cultural group. The curation of brooches, both at West Ness and Neep, 
were likely heirlooms and could have signified their familial power and status over their extensive use. When paired with brooches of different cultural affiliation, they combined to signal power in multiple societies. Having used a socio-semiotics approach, I hope to have shown the importance of production, circulation, and consumption in the interpretation of messages being signaled by brooches during the Viking Age. Thank you.